Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we're just coming to your presence once again by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit who leads us, guides us, directs us, gives us great comfort. We just ask that our motives be pure and that we be sincere as we study your word together. I just ask that the Holy Spirit would filter out all of that which is foolish, but seal to our hearts only that which is truth, that we may grow in grace and knowledge of Christ our Lord. For it's in his name I pray. Amen. In our Bible survey series, uh, we've reached the fourth chapter of Acts, and we, uh, we stopped in uh, the middle of the chapter last week at verse 23. We're at the paragraph beginning at verse 23 of chapter 4. One of the great problems with a two-party system such as we have here in the United States. One of its great difficulties in functioning efficiently is that if your party happens to be the one in power, then you are prone to defend everything that they do, and if your party is not in power, then of course you sort of pick at everything that they do when we reach the 23rd verse of the fourth chapter, the apostles, uh, particularly Peter and the apostles, had just had a conflict with the Sadducees who were the predominant power in the Sanhedrin. The parties of the day uh, were the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Uh, the Pharisees believed in the resurrection. Uh, they were legalists and separatists. In fact, the word means separatist. The, the Sadducees, on the other hand, uh, put strong importance uh, on the things of this life, teaching that there, there is no resurrection from the dead. And they happen to be the ones in power. When the Lord Jesus Christ rose from the dead and He commissioned His disciples and uh, and then ascended up into heaven, the place that they chose to gather was the colonnade around the temple. The enormous temple mount of Herod had a 40-foot wide colonnade around it. Uh, the eastern colonnade was, was called Solomon's colonnade or Solomon's porch. And that was used by Jesus and the early Christians as a place of meeting and a place of teaching. They recognized it as the house of the Lord, and that's where they assembled. And this is where the Sadducees found them, uh, took them before the council, uh, scolded them, and finally commanded them not to teach anymore. And that's where we're at as we begin our survey series this morning. When they let them go, they returned to their own company, uh, verse 23, and they reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said unto them. And when they heard that, they lifted up their voice, the text says, to God with one accord and said, Lord, who hast made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and, and so forth? Now, I suppose that the characteristic thing to do today would be to come back to the group and talk about all the rotten doctrine of the Sadducees, you know, and how far that they were really were from the truth and how ridiculous that their claims were and, and on and on we might go. Now, I'm, I'm not exactly sure what the apostles reported, but I see nothing in the account, nothing, or that they denounce their doctrine. Uh, not that that's a, an implicit defense. Uh, some, 
we'd have to be foolish to argue from silence, I guess. But however, to me, it's clear that it's not God's purpose to criticize Paul in his great sermon on Mars Hill. Uh, he didn't spend the major portion of his message, you know, tearing down the ignorance and the foolishness of the Greeks but rather presenting the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And what the disciples uh, could have done, what the uh, apostles could have done, you know, is, is come back first of all and denounce the Sadducees. And then in their prayer to Almighty God, they could have asked that, you know, some kind of retribution, some kind of judgment be leveled against them. We see no such spirit as that in our text. I believe that there are many lessons to learn as the Holy Spirit reveals to us what the Lord Jesus Christ did and what the disciples did. As I've pointed out on several occasions, Christ could have made tremendous contributions to mankind. You know, if you just taught them about germs, you know, scream doors, you know. But he, he taught them the Word of God. Obviously, that was more important to God. In the 24th verse, they lift up their voices uh, to God with one accord. Now, I do not believe that that is any uh, argument to say that, well, that they all prayed at the same time so that you couldn't possibly hear or understand what went on. This is not an argument for confusion. I believe the one accord is that they were all in agreement with this prayer. Now, who prayed it, whether it was Peter or John or, or whoever, I don't know, but I believe it was done decently and in order that the one accord does not mean that they were all yelling out at the same time, but that they were all in agreement with what is prayed. You'll find in the 24th verse, the word Lord, this, this word, however, happens to be despote is the word. It's not curios, it's despote, meaning a, an authority figure, a master who exercises complete jurisdiction wields unrestricted power. The word implies someone exercising unrestricted power and absolute domination. Uh, the word is our English word despot. How that word today in English uh, has an evil sort of con connotation that the Greek word doesn't is what I want you to understand here. What, what the Greek word means is one who is in absolute authority, in absolute control. All the things that they could have talked about. Okay, the close call, the, the danger that they were in, uh, their opportunity for witness could have done all the things that we normally do today. They didn't do any of those things. Their appearance before the Sadducees was in the plan of our sovereign God. My Bible says here in the English, Lord, thou art God, but the word God there, theos, is not there in the Greek. Somehow the, the English translators had to translate uh, despotes, Lord thy God, rather than the, the simple uh, translation, the translation that should be there. Sovereign God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in it. Now, if we really believe that a sovereign God made the heaven and earth and the sea and all that's in it, including the Sadducees, then one really wouldn't have to spend much time tearing them down or criticizing their doctrine. Not when their God is sovereign. Now in the 25th verse, the Holy Spirit speaks through David in the second psalm. 
Now, there are many arguments uh, among Christians. I'm sim simply going to tell you what the truth is, and then you can decide for yourself. This psalm is to be understood of the Messiah, whatever you want to call God in the Old Testament. Elohim, uh, He's the sovereign creator. Jehovah uh, or Yahweh, He is God with man, the God of redemption. And that Greek word is rios, and it is used of the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's then, it's then more than passing you know, interest that Jehovah in the Old Testament is a rock. Christ is a rock. Jehovah uh, the, is the way. Christ is the way. Uh, Jehovah is fire. Christ is fire. And so on and on it goes. Uh, Jehovah is, is light. Christ is light. Obviously, the Holy Spirit is revealing that the Jehovah of the Old Testament who dealt with Israel is the Christ of the New. And the difference between His dealings in the Old Testament uh, and His dealings in the New was the cross because the law was fulfilled in Christ so that God can declare us no longer under law as a principle or, or a rule of life. And so we have Curios, uh, Lord, in verse 26. We have the sovereign God in verse 24. In the second psalm, the nations are gathered together against His Christ, against the Lord's Christ. Jehovah's Christ. And here, once again, we have an incidental testimony to the deity of our Lord Jesus Christ. And the word Jesus, I believe, speaks of His humanity. The Lord Jesus Christ is truly God and truly man. If He's not truly man, He's not our kinsman redeemer. For of a truth against thy holy child Jesus, whom thou hast anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. Great separation in the Word of God are the nations and the people of Israel. The people of Israel are God's people. The nations were those who were not God's people. Those are just broad categories that were used in the Old Testament. And now here it says, in passing that both those who are not God's people and those who are God's people cooperated together, together, against the Lord Jesus Christ. Surely we need to recognize that, that literally thousands of those people who cried crucify Him are soon to be members of the local assembly because they are, in fact, God's people. They were at that time. Why should God otherwise differentiate between the nations and the Israelites? Both God's own people and those who are not God's people were gathered together against Christ. To do what? To do exactly whatever thy hand and thy counsel had determined beforehand to be done. I mean, certainly, you know, had you asked anyone in that multitude, well, you know, what are you doing? They would have said, well, we're crucifying Christ, you know, because we think that, that he ought to be crucified. The truth of the matter is they're doing exactly what God had predetermined to be done. Of course, now we can enter into uh, great discussions on free will. And dearly beloved, I don't know how that those discussions ever even started. I don't know how many times in my ministry someone has come to me and said, you know, Steve, what about man's free will? Well, what about it? I mean, where did you get that? 
There is not a single verse of Scripture that supports the popular concept of man's free will as it regards his redemption. And here were people, I'm certain, had you interrogated them at the moment, they were freely and honestly doing what they thought ought to be done. The truth of the matter is they were doing exactly what God's counsel and God's determination had before decided to be done. And now, Lord, verse 29, Behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word. They didn't ask for any protection. They didn't ask for any judgment against these people. They didn't ask for any retribution. They didn't ask for any guards. Our request is we speak thy word. We don't want to be intimidated, but the request is not that you devastate these folks but just give us boldness that we might be able to, what? Speak Thy Word. Not our Word, but Your Word. To me, that is an amazing consideration. Today, congregations are much more interested and willing to listen to man's Word than this book. I think it is sad that it would almost be impossible to function under normal church organizations today, if you did nothing but speak the truth of this book, you'd be in the same kind of difficulty, dearly beloved, that the apostles found themselves in here in our text. Because to a great extent, the Word of God is contrary to the doctrine of the church today. You've got to bear in mind that had you roamed the streets of Jerusalem at that time, where is God worshipped? Well, in the temple. Who are God's people? Well, the leaders. The leaders in the temple. Well, where is God's Word? Well, it's right there. It's right there, rolled up in the scroll. Well, who are the experts? Well, those would be the Pharisees, the Sadducees. They're the experts. They know it backwards. They know it forwards. They know all the grammar all the syntax, all the context. They know all of the tradition, all of the background. They know the law. In fact, they've written hundreds of commentaries on the, the commandments, even setting up fence laws to keep you anywhere near to coming to uh, uh, close to breaking God's law. There's where the experts are. The Lord Jesus Christ called them the children of the devil. They were the recognized church authority, the recognized experts, the recognized theologians. And they were not, not speaking the Word of God. And I believe that we're in a time of famine as God has declared in His Word. All they wanted was boldness to speak the Word. Not to build an organization. Not that their church might prosper. Not that the offerings might increase or get bigger. Or the crowds get larger. Or the enthusiasm more intense. But that this book might be spoken. Today there is a tremendous move for emotionalism and enthusiasm and fire and I don't know what all what all you know other words you want to use and the more of that the less the content the less the word of god we want boldness in speaking the word of god any emotion dearly beloved has to be related to the truth of this book it's not apart from it. By stretching forth thine hand to heal. Now that's, that's surely a reference to the fact that the lame man had just been healed. 
that signs and wonders may be done by the name of the Holy Child Jesus. The Jews require a sign, and the apostles' ministry was to Jews. Uh, Paul's ministry was to Gentiles. And surely one doesn't need to be much of a Bible student to see that the sign ministry was to Israel. The major function of Paul's ministry to the Gentiles was not by signs. Israel required a sign. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where that they were assembled together and, and they were all, not just the apostles, but all of the Christians were controlled by the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit. That doesn't mean that they had more of the Holy Spirit than they had before, that they were, you know, sort of half a half empty jug in, into which some more was poured until it was flowing, overflowing, but they were controlled by the Holy Spirit. And what happened? Oh, well, they spake in tongues and they performed miracles and healings and such. No, no. Again, they spoke the Word of God with boldness. So actually what they prayed for in verse 29 is what they got in verse 31. They spoke God's Word without fear. Well, we seem rather separated from that because somehow or other we feel that, you know, that we're at least isolated from Christian persecution. You know, we can understand a, a desire to speak the word with boldness where, you know, if we were in China or North Korea or Russia or, where, you know, where, wherever, wherever it might uh, cost us our business, our homes, our, our lives, if we were to boldly speak the Word of God. But in the U.S., and here in this country, we appear to be shielded from all of that. And yet I can honestly testify that many, many friends of mine who are in the ministry have admitted openly to me over the years that there are certain things that they are afraid to teach because it would split up their church, it would break up their assembly, it would definitely have an effect on their offerings. They'd go down. They couldn't pay the bills or whatever. The result of all the prayer, all, the, all that submission to the sovereignty of God was that they spoke the Word of God without fear when the multitude of those who believed were of, of one heart and one soul. So the rest of the fourth chapter is now a picture of early communism, right? I've, I've talked about that a little in the last video. Not at all. You know, someone asked us to believe that the, the rich people, you know, they sold everything that they had and they gave it to the church so that they're now poor. And the poor people got the distribution of, of this wealth uh, so that they're now rich. And now it's a cycle kind of thing. And that's not what the passages say. What it does say is that nobody sold his possessions that he didn't count as belonging to God. When it says all things common, that word is not the word for communism. This does not remove personal and private ownership as we'll see. We'll see later on here in the text. It simply says that those who had fields and whatever fields were necessary it does not say all who own fields sold their fields. It says as many that's, that did sell them. You, you can't draw from the text that all land or houses or owners, you know, uh, sold their property and they gave every penny of it to the apostles, uh, but that those whom the Lord had richly blessed were willing to recognize that these were God's blessings and God's grace, and God's property, and they were willing to use it for those who were less blessed. We can't build an entire doctrine on one passage of Scripture. 
There's no passage of Scripture that is of individual interpretation. And as we go through Scripture, we see that God's principle is that if a man is willing to work and able to work, and he does work, and he needs help, he ought to get it. And I believe that that's a proper Christian principle. Because Christians were unwilling to do that. Well, the government, here they step in, they tax us. And so the government, you know, does it for us, you know, with a lot of bureaucracy and a lot of waste. But I believe it was God's intention from the very beginning that, that we not hoard or that we not treasure our own personal possessions, that we'd be willing to use them to help others who are less fortunate than ourselves. and with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And gr great grace was upon them. Great grace was upon them all. It was not an area of works. This willingness to share with one another was not one based on works, but one based on grace, unmerited favor. And the witness was of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You got to remember the high priest. The high priest taught that there is no resurrection, whereas the apostles taught the resurrection from the dead. It was a spirit of love and a spirit of grace. So we're willing to help one another. Many as were. Uh, possessors of lands or houses, they sold them and they brought the, the prices of the things that were sold, not all the things, but the things which they sold, willingly sold, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet. And then distribution was made. The whole thing to me speaks of order and of control. There was a guy whose name was Joseph. He was uh, surnamed by the apostles Barnabas. I believe this is the Holy Spirit's uh, introduction to Barnabas. Soon he'll be a, a missionary with Paul. Uh, Barnabas was a wealthy guy. You know, we find him as a missionary with Paul, mending tents. He was not so selfish, so centered in, in materialism that, that he was unwilling to give whatever was necessary in his service for Christ. His name was Joseph, but the apostles named him Son of Consolation. He was one who was able to comfort others. It says that he was a Levite. He had uh, some land. How much he had, I, I have no idea. But he had some land, and he sold it, and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. And there was a guy sitting in the congregation whose name was Ananias. And he said, well, you know, that's pretty nice. You know, look at that. The apostles changed his name from Joseph to Barnabas. Let's, let's do something like that. You know, we got some land. We'll sell it. Now, we won't give it all. But the congregation, they, they, didn't, they don't have to know that. We'll give some of it. We'll give some of the money. We'll bring it. We'll publicly give it. And we can get some of the same praise that Barnabas got. Sounds like a good idea. I mean, his wife was privy to it. They sold the land for whatever they, whatever they got. They brought uh, less than the amount in. Uh, both of them testified that this is in fact what they got for the land. And, and Ananias and Sapphira died. Now that's a quick survey of, of the first 11 verses of the chapter. This is the last case, I believe, where God uh, instantaneously strikes someone dead. Now we have uh, 
sort of the same thing repeated several times in Scripture. And I, I figure the Holy Spirit expects us to learn something from something that occurs repeatedly. You know, when we think of David uh, sending Uriah out to be murdered, you know, I don't, I don't care how you paint it or how you try to whitewash it. The truth of the matter is that a man of God, one after God's own heart here, who was the monarch of Israel, who could have had anything that he wanted, premeditatedly murdered a man, stole his wife, committed adultery, and had a child out of wedlock. So he ought to be struck dead, right? But he wasn't. Moses, here we got another one. Moses, he murders a guy, a, an Egyptian, and then, and then the, the cheat and the coward that he is, he digs a hole in the sand, hides the body, rather than admit the, the crime. We call that a hit and run today. And he's not struck dead. Now, all in the world Nahab and Abihu did was a little ignorance in the worship of God. God struck them dead. And Uzziah is even a worse case because all in the world that he was trying to do was help God out a little bit. God struck him dead. Man, that's, that's so vastly different than, than murder and adultery and robbery and, and Hitler's treatment of the Jews. All Ananias... Ananias and Sapphira wanted to do was lie to God and keep a little bit of the money and they're both dead now. Now, the proper approach today is at, at least, you know, well, we got some of the money. You know, bless, bless their hearts. You know, Lord bless you. You know, that's more than what most of the congregation gives. I don't see any indication that Peter and the others counted it. What we have to do is, is run out and count the offering. You know, it doesn't matter, you know, whether we're worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth. We gotta we gotta get that counted right away. And boy, there's a tremendous drive today for money. I think you know that. I think you'd admit that. I think that God has put these cases here number one to, to just show us the, the vast gulf between our thinking and God's thinking and the tremendous importance that God places upon spiritual purity you know we would put the emphasis on moral purity and, and I plead with you folks not to understand what I'm saying here I am not I'm not defending moral impurity but I believe that I have a Bible that clearly indicates that God is a jealous God. I also believe that this case is, is here for us to read in order, so that we might learn that it's not the service but the attitude. We're prone to put all the importance on the money that they bring. Uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a shame, you know, we didn't get the whole $10,000, but man, you know, if we got five thousand, that's that's a good that's a good deal. Okay, you know, we'd be terrified. You know, you know, if they if they just gave ten percent, that's that, that's because that's all we ask. We we normal uh, church, you know, the normal church is is pretty much persuaded that if you're you know you're you're not even tithing your the ten percent you're supposed to. Surely God puts the emphasis on the motive. Ananias, Ananias lied about it, okay? The text says, you know, and not that he lied uh, to Peter, but he lied to the Holy Spirit. What he said they were doing, they were doing for God. And what is clearly evident is he was doing it for praise. It's not his lie to Peter about the amount of the money, but his lie to God. That's what was important to God. Nahab and Abihu who offered strange worship, uh, that doesn't seem to like much to us. We're, we're much more concerned about physical law. God is, is jealous about the purity of the worship. Uh, Uzzah offered uh, defense for, you know, you know, he was involved in 
moving the ark of God in a unscriptural way, but boy, it was it was a good way. You know, I mean, he had the drum majorettes out there. He had he had the high school band. He had you know he had a ox cart drawn by oxen. You know, on which they'd never been harnessed. He had a, a parade. You know, with the the local fire department, you know, and all that. And, and man, this was a this was a pretty big deal. You know, we're moving the ark of the Lord. If we're going to do this, man, I mean, if we're going to do something for God, you know, we ought to do it. We ought to do it right. Surely, if you're going to uh, do it for the Lord, it ought to be the best that you can do. We got a big parade moving the ark of Jehovah back to Jerusalem. But that's not the way that you move the ark of Jehovah. Though it surely looks uh, good. Enthusiasm for the Lord. You know, everybody's you know, on fire. The dancers are there, but it's, it's not God's way and God's struck and dead. God does not need your help, okay? Or my help. In Nahab and, and Abihu, I see theological error. You know, it isn't that I don't uh, see theological error in Uzzah, but I see theological poor practice you know, in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, I see theological poor worship. God is intensely interested in the purity of His Word, in the purity of our motives, in the purity of our service, and in the purity of our worship. It was what Ananias and Sapphira were saying to the Holy Spirit that caused their demise. Not what that they were saying, not what they were saying to Peter. There are further uh, lessons in the text. Had the Holy Spirit not given us this paragraph, 1 through 11, we might have concluded that, you know, what, what, what many have concluded, and that is that the early Christians did in fact uh, try, you know, experimented with communism. Ananias brought in money. Uh, Peter said, you know, you sold land. Yes, you know, this is what you got for it. Yes, you're doing... You know, you're giving this to God, yes. You know, and then Peter says to Ananias, apparently God had revealed this fully to him. You know, I'm, I believe he did. I believe Peter knew that he was going to die. You know, we can ask a tremendous number of questions like, you know, what did they get for the, the land? You know, how much did they keep and how much did they give and, and, and how much did they hold back? You know, did they give 90% and keep 10 or did they give... 10% and keep back nine. None of those things are of, a, of any importance or shouldn't be of any importance. Now the Holy Spirit, not Peter, the Holy Spirit says to Ananias, wasn't the land yours? The answer to that is without question, yes. Couldn't you have done with it anything that you wanted to do with that land? Well, the answer without any question is absolutely. When you sold it, you got money. Wasn't that money yours? Well, the answer has to be without any question, yes. Couldn't you have done anything with the money that you wanted to do? And the answer has to be yes. And dearly beloved, none of those answers are communistic. Now you come and lay this money here. What are you saying? You're saying to the Holy Spirit, this is our worship. And you're lying. Because what you're really doing is saying, I want the praise of the congregation. I want the same praise you gave Barnabas. And now here's a case in the Scriptures where many a minister has tried to wring more funds out of you guys, wring more money out of the congregation, you all out there, you just, you've got money that belongs to God that you don't need. So you ought to put it in the collection plate. And folks, I, I don't believe money has any part and parcel of the story at all. The account is given because they were declaring an act to be worship, which in fact was not. We are to worship God in spirit and in truth. It was an effort to 
gain human praise, whereas all of our worship ought to be centered in the praise of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he died. When his wife came in, apparently she didn't know that he had died. I can visualize some case in my life, uh, you know, that if I died, it'd be at least, you know, three hours before my wife found it out. Three hours went by. She comes in. She'd been getting her hair done at the beauty parlor. She didn't know her husband was dead. I don't know where she had I don't know where she had been. The Holy Spirit doesn't bother to explain it to me. She didn't know what happened. Peter didn't tell her. Is this in fact what you sold the land for? Yes. So you're offering this as a worship to the Lord? Yes. That wasn't true. They were offering that to get what Barnabas got, or at least what they thought Barnabas got. Surely the indication is that what Barnabas did is give it as unto the Lord. What Ananias and Sapphira did is connive together to give it in order to gain. And they lied in saying, uh, not, that, not that they held back some of the, of the amount, but that this is a worship. This is an act of worship to the Lord. And she fell down immediately, verse 10, and died. Now, I don't believe that either one of them went to hell. I got a commentary that says that they did. In fact, the commentary says something to the effect that, you know, isn't it a shame that people who, who uh, come, become involved in the service of Jesus Christ can, can change so drastically that, that judgment falls on them and they go to hell? Folks, I don't believe that Nahab and Abihu went to hell. I don't believe that Uzzah went to hell. Now you're entitled to your opinion. You're, you're not, you are, you are not going to see David, I don't believe, in hell. Okay? He committed premeditated murder. He was a man after God's own heart. Uh, Abihu wasn't a graduate of Dallas Theological Seminary. Okay? But I'll, I, I believe I'll see him in heaven. And I believe that you're going to see us there. I think you're going to see yourself there. A dedicated Christian who was doing something great for God and it was only incidental that it wasn't God's way. I think we're surrounded with thousands of people like that today. I do not think that they are hellbound. My Bible says that I shouldn't be amazed that Satan arrays his messengers as as ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I'm certain that some of them are Satan's messengers and some of them are gods who are simply ignorantly involved in the same kind of activity as Satan's messengers. That's what I believe and I'm not asking you to agree with me. So the Holy Spirit gives us this account that we might recognize that we're looking at the wrong thing. The detail is not the money and what they held back. The detail is the worship and that, and that they lied in that act of worship. Now it says great fear came upon all the church and upon as many as heard these things. The word fear is our, is our familiar word, phobos. It's, it's not fear as in, you know, this... Uh, untamed Mustang horse is going to kill me. But they, that they had great respect for the Word of God and the worship of God. Well, we're going to stop there at verse 11. The Lord willing, we'll uh, continue with the uh, survey next week. Now sure, there is an area of choice. Okay, I am not arguing that there isn't some area of choice in our walk, in our lives as Christians. 
The argument over free will is normally limited in theological circles to whether the human, the, the individual, has a right to become a child of God, whether he has a right to choose heaven and hell. No such concept exists at all in this book. Okay? We present it that way in many churches, but it's not Scripture. Well, I ask that you please pray for my health and the direction of this ministry. We love you all. We truly do. This is Steve. Thanks for watching.